Hi, I'm Bill, the Domestic Monk. Welcome back to the third and final part of my fascinating interview with Brian Hoyland about his near-death experience in 2017. You can watch part one on the suffering Brian endured during the years and months leading up to his NDE, and part two, where Brian tells us about his death, his encounters with God and Jesus, and his life review on the Domestic Monk YouTube homepage. In this video, Brian tells us about the choice Jesus gave him that brought him back to life and the three remarkable lessons that Jesus taught him. And then he tells us about his long road to recovery. This segment is packed full of spiritual insights that you do not want to miss. I hope you enjoy listening to it as much as I enjoyed talking with Brian about My it. My choice was that I, I realized at this point that the reason I wanted to go back wasn't for my kids now, wasn't for my wife, my, you know, people in my job or whoever else I thought might need me, right? The world doesn't really need Brian Hoyland, you know? I realized that the reason I wanted to go back is because the world needs Jesus, and I want to be the person who shares yeah. his love. I want to do, and that was the right answer. Keep in mind, again, I, I have to really reiterate the fact that I tell this story in a linear fashion, but it's all happening at once, because the very next part is so important, but that's part of why this choice was so obvious, and I, I, I feel so strongly about it because it falls into the three things that Jesus had told me. And the things that he told me were in a way of all of this, this exploration of my life review and how much he loves me, and all that was coming together all at the same time. But it, it translates better into to these three things. So. The three things that he had told me was that I needed to pray more. You know, part of that was I started off real well, but I had to have consolations. I don't get a lot of consolations now. So when I pray, it doesn't always feel great and warm and fuzzy. When I came back, it felt wonderful. It, it, that euphoria was unlike anything you could ever imagine. Yet, it doesn't always happen like that for me now. But I pray far more than I ever had before, and I enjoy it so much more than I did when I would get those warm fuzzies because I'm connecting with God and I know it. I know that there's no distance between us. And, and I can explain more about that because that's another important part of the, the story. So he tells me I need to pray more. And it wasn't simply you know just praying my rosary, which I have increased that. So it wasn't just doing that kind of a prayer or simply asking for things. That certainly wasn't what he was telling me to do. You know, praying for other people was a good thing. He wanted me to do all these things, but it was to live my life as a prayer. To actually make every action I do, fulfilling my duties as a husband and a father, that's a prayer. That's, that's living my prayer because it's service to God. Putting, putting God first, everything else falls in place. It's unbelievable how easy your life is when you stop caring about controlling the outcomes. When you start to let God work through you, your whole life really can become a prayer, but it's staying in that, that connection with him, constantly co contemplating him, keeping him in your mind, and making decisions consciously about what does God want me to do in this moment. That's the way that, that we need to pray more. It, and it doesn't mean you'll cut down your rosary. No, you pray more rosaries. Definitely do more, more rosaries. Pray more novenas. Pray all these things that we need. I meditate more than I ever had. My Lectio Divina is incredible. I, I really, really enjoy it. To a, the point that, like the rich young man, I've been meditating on for two months now. So, I mean, think about that. And it's, it doesn't get boring. So this is, this is the way that you know, our prayer lives can be so rich. And there's so much that can, can be, be layered into our connection with God. But it's more than just those things. It's all of those things combined and living for his will. That's incredible, Brian. I can't imagine what it must be like having gone through that experience. And what it must be like now praying the sorrowful mysteries of the rosary when you have that firsthand experience in your life on how your own sin affected Jesus on the cross. For most of us, that's an abstract concept. Many of us can't get our heads around it ever in our life, but you were shown that specifically. That's got to just have an incredible impact. Yeah, it's, it, it has had a huge impact, particularly knowing that his heart was hurting more than my heart hurt. 
You know, to, I mean, you think about that. And I mean, everybody can, you don't have to have a heart condition like mine to know that my heart was hurting. If you yeah. drink too much coffee, you can realize how much your heart can hurt. And so that's nothing compared to what I was experiencing. What I was experiencing was nothing compared to what he had to experience. So that just puts it in perspective. So, Brian, you mentioned once, which I found really insightful from a Catholic perspective, the best model for prayer was the life of the, of the Blessed Mother. Like, her whole life was a prayer. How do we as Catholics, how do we take that example and incorporate it into our lives so that we can live more that way? You know, the, the best answer I think I have is when I look at how she lived her life, she never once asked for any kind of acc accolade or any kind of accommodation to be met for her. She never seemed to ask for anything for herself. Not once. I can't find any place in the Bible where she tried to focus on herself. Everything was focused on Jesus. Now, we all have egos. We all have things that we have to deal with, and that's part of our fallen nature. But the more we, we work towards subduing it, the more God's grace will be there. My, my confessions, you know, I won't reveal all the, the details of it, probably is inappropriate, but my confessions are often looking at how many times did I refuse a grace? You know, somebody says something to me, and then I feel upset about it. I don't even have to say anything. I don't have to act on that. But I, for that moment, just a quick moment sometimes, I'll get upset. Like, how? why would they say that to me? You know, first off, who am I to really think that I shouldn't be talked to that way? You know, not that I, I think I should be a doormat. I don't endorse somebody else sinning. But I'm judging that that person doesn't have the right to talk to me like that. Somehow I'm putting myself above that person even if it's just for a split second. And what I realize is that when I am first coming to that thought, if I don't push it out right away, I'm refusing a grace. Because once I realize what I'm doing, God's giving me a grace to pull back and go towards perfection. And perfection is to just pray for that person, to forgive that person immediately, immediately just forgive them. Then I can get closer to perfection. So when I'm going to confession, I'm thinking about all the times that I didn't immediately forgive somebody. That's one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you from the very first video I saw. Because just that insight you had on the Blessed Mother, and this insight, the way you can evaluate your own actions and how they impact your spiritual life. I mean, that's the essence of the Catholic faith. There are so many Catholics that don't understand that. And it's a difficult concept to grasp, but that's the incredible insight. Humility, right? That's what we're talking about. How do we get out of the way, like you said earlier, to let God's love in and get out of our own way? We can take Jesus' word for, for it ourselves. You know, he says, pick up your cross every day and follow me. That doesn't mean that our life is going to be a bed of roses. In fact, it seems to tell me that every day I'm going to have a cross that I need to, to carry. And no. it may be... You know, in the, in the grand scheme of things, somebody insulting me or just being rude to me or you know, not caring about my opinion, well, that's, that's not really a big deal. However, when it happens to us, it does make all of us feel a little something. Yeah. And when we don't embrace that as a cross, as, as a way to subdue our ego, we're refusing to, to let humility and meekness rule us, to be part of us. And... He says, learn from me, I'm meek and humble of heart. How do we try not to do carrying our cross every day like he tells us, and at the same time not be meek and humble of heart like he tells us? We're truly just trying to do what we want, not what he wants. And of course we're going to have misery and sadness in our lives then. Yeah. But when we flip that on its head and we start to do the things he wants, and that's why it goes with you know praying constantly. That's what he's telling me is to live a life of prayer. This is how you do it. Stay connected to me and you will have these things fall into place. And it's really that simple. And that's why it's, it's a blessing being Catholic. You know, I have had very few priests tell me not to, to, to come so often to confession. I go to confession at least once a week now. Wow. And it's because I'm seeing that you know, I don't have mortal sin. And some, sometimes there will be people say, well, you, know, you don't have to come for that, that sin. You know, it's forgiven at Mass, blah, blah, blah. You know what? This, this is a process of, first off, I'm, I'm getting 
to receive a sacrament. I'm getting grace by doing this. And I will often confess things that I've already confessed before. And I'll tell the priest, look, I'm going to confess an old sin because I want to have the grace from it again. I want to have a growing in my grace. I'm not, I'm not refusing graces. Any chance I get a chance to do it, I'm going to go for it. But the thing I have learned is the more that I stay on top of this, the less that that sneaky enemy has a chance of pulling me off the path towards God. He wants to take my focus off of Jesus, and I'm not going to let him. I, that, I, and I think that, that's a grace, too. I think, I think that we all have that ability. It's just, it takes some work, because initially we're weak. We're weak in it, you know? But he wants to give us the grace to be strong. That's why the sacrament of confession is such an amazing thing. You know, I help teach RCIA at our parish, and I tell him, I just sponsored a guy through uh, RCIA that's an on-fire Catholic. And this difference between what the Catholic faith and what the saints teach us is what you learned in your experience from Jesus himself. But real holiness starts there. Now you've got to really look at yourself, and that's when it gets hard, right? That's when you're on the road to holiness, saying, okay... Now I've gotten rid of this big burden that I've been carrying around. You know, when you go to your first confession and you unload those big sins, you just drop on a rock you've been carrying around and it's a huge relief. But now I have to scrutinize who I am and my actions and that gets ugly. You know, when I talk about, you know, how fearful I am about judgment, that's what motivates me to do that. Because I'd rather scrutinize myself now and scrape myself bare than to have to undergo that in front of the Lord himself, right? Yeah, it's better to have it already out there in the open. It's like, hey, we already talked about this. And, you know, that lesson will be easier to get through when you're there. Yeah. But, but you know, it's easier for us as well to, to, to really start to do that work now because we're not going to add more sins to ourselves. You know, if, if we're only going in dropping that big, huge bomb down the first time and then waiting until another one comes, well, all we're doing is waiting until another one comes. So another one will come. You know? right. If we're doing the steps to go closer to perfection, it doesn't matter if I don't achieve perfection. i got to try. I mean, that's my fault if I'm not trying. Yes. But when I go in and, I, and I'm looking at how many times did I refuse a grace, because I chose to do what I wanted instead, even if it's just simply feeling a feeling, those feelings are worthless. They're not there in heaven. So why do I want to entertain them in this life? Okay, so we talked about the first one. Yep, that's right. So he told me that I need to suffer joyfully. Now, this was a concept that was played out in all of the suffering that I had experienced and the understanding that I'm going to have more suffering worse than what I had already experienced. And he didn't give me an end date on when that will, will be over. I certainly don't consider my suffering to be the same now as it was then. It's quite a bit easier. You know, people can often speculate that maybe it's because of this experience. I certainly don't think that it hurt. But I think that it has more to do with trusting in God. I think my trust in God has increased because of this experience because I saw how I was trusting in myself prior to it and it did no good. I trusted in doctors and that was a complete waste of time. Not that you know I'm going to bash on my doctors, but they, they, didn't, they didn't do a whole lot. And I realized that that trusting in God, he'll give the doctor what they need. He'll give me the information that I need and the help in making proper decisions if I let him. And if I choose to do it my own way, he'll let me do that too. And then I have to deal with those consequences. But suffering joyfully was so deep because it was not just this, this it's not a love for the actual pain of the suffering. You know, it, it's not like I'm craving to get beat up all the time, you know. And that's not what it's about. It's about being indifferent to whether or not I'm suffering or not suffering. Being being unconcerned with my physical life now because it's like that building block on the path to heaven. It's that everything that I see in front of me is something that he's allowing to have happen. And if he's allowing it to happen, then it can be for my own good. It can yeah. be for my own destruction if I refuse to accept it. And that's what it is. It's just accepting God's will. And... 
he'll make it easy. It's like when you mentioned about getting your skin filleted and being, you know, roasted alive. We've we've got saints who have had to go through those those horrible tortures, and they make jokes like, "Hey, I'm done on this side. Flip me over." Yeah, how amazing, right? And when we think about that, we think, "I don't know if I could do that." Well, of course not. None of us can. They can't do it either. It's because they let God help them through it. You know, they suffer joyfully because they accept the, the suffering that's in front of them for that time, and they say it's God's will. And when you do that, it changes the suffering. It's no longer a big deal. It's as if, you know, I ran marathons. That's a suffering. But I wanted the enjoyment of satisfaction of completing a marathon. And then after I did that, I wanted to continue to collect the stupid medals, which I ended up throwing away because who cares about the medals, right? After you get a bag full of them, it's like, ah, big deal. You know, the point is, is that we can find a lot of things to suffer for, you know? People will sometimes get a job that's 200 miles away from where they live, and they have to drive 200 miles each way. That's craziness to me. Yeah. Whoever, that person needs that job, they're willing to suffer that because of the reward they're getting. The reward we get in heaven is far exceeds anything we're ever going to have from a reward here on earth. So whatever suffering we get is nothing when it compares to that. It's just a minor road bump. It's just a, it's like, if, if I got to sleep in a tent when I'm camping, big deal, you know, cry me a river about that. In fact, that's actually kind of nice to be able to be out in the woods and camp. If you look at it differently, it's not a big deal. But some people find it hard to have any kind of inconvenience in their life. And you can, you can make these, and people, I feel bad for them when they say, oh, but I have this disease and I have this disease. Yeah, I get it. I've had a lot of those diseases too. You know, you talk about cancers, you talk about these things. Yep, but you know what was worse? Was the thing that actually killed me. The thing that actually killed me was far worse. And I had to come back to it and still endure it. And I'm going to tell you, when you give your trust to God and you accept what you have to go through, even if it does lead to your death, who cares? You're going to go to heaven if you're trusting in God. If you whine and cry about it, then you're going to get what you've called for, what you've been begging for, which is your own will. And your will can't save you. And it's, it's a harsh reality sometimes to think about. But the beautiful thing is, he doesn't make everything suffering. My life is full of so many joys. And yeah, there's, there's been some pain along the way. You know, when I came back to it, it there was a lot more suffering. It, it definitely, he didn't hide that from me. It, he was right. But I would have missed out on seeing my kids continue to grow up. I would have missed out on my grandchild being born. I mean, there's so many things that I have been blessed with. And yeah, I've got to suffer every once in a while. I've got to deal with some things that I just don't particularly like dealing with. And would I like to have it a different way? I don't know, maybe I would, but honestly, at this point in my life, I'm looking at it and saying, these are the things that are gonna bring me closer to him. I don't want anything different. Quite honestly, when things, when I'm not suffering, I'm kind of wondering, am I, am I not close enough to him now? Because there's nothing like suffering to bring you closer to God. It brings you to your knees. You know, when things are going well in my life, that doesn't make me want to pray as much. I am very grateful for things, so I do pray, don't get me wrong. But when you're told, you're not going to live through this. Boy, you hit your knees quick. You don't care if the doctor's watching or not. It's like, hey, you know what? Wait a second. I got to do some praying here. There are no atheists in foxholes, right? That's right. That's right. And, you know, so we know, we know that when things are hard, that's when we pray the best because we really have motivation. Nothing's a greater motivator than suffering. But when you think about coming into this world, that's the price of admission. Our lives are suffering. There's physical suffering from the day we're born. We're growing older. We're dying, in a sense, from the moment we're born. We have poor air quality. We have hot sun. We have cold winters. We have all kinds of things that are suffering. we got to walk a mile. I don't know. You pick the suffering and we've got it. And those are also things that people enjoy. And it's often our own mind playing into it because we don't want to experience whatever it is that we're experiencing because we want something different at that moment. Yeah. But if we got that different thing, we'd be complaining about that and wanting something else. 
we're never going to be happy because we constantly want something new until we tame that that desire and and that desire is just our fallenness for for more we're insatiable and if we don't control that then we're doomed to be constantly miserable all right so the third thing that jesus taught you is to share his love now this for me this is as much a, as a struggle as a concept of redemptive suffering sharing god's love you know we know it's willing the best of the other, right? It's not a, a feeling like it's romanticized on a movie screen, but a very difficult concept to grapple with and to put into action. I mean, how do you see love now, particularly after this conversation with Jesus about that? You know, it's, it comes out in a lot of different ways. You know, there are people who are more difficult to love than others. You know, somebody who's really loving and caring, you know, I, I think of priests often. When, when you have a priest who's willing to hear confessions for hours and hours a day, and then they go from that to, to celebrating Mass, and then they go from that to having spiritual direction, and, you know, we all understand, yeah, that, that's a lot of time here and here and here and here. When do they get to sleep? When do they get to go work out? When do they get to do the... But they're sacrificing that because they love me enough to... And, and they're not hugging me and... and filling my, my head full of all these wonderful things about who I am. You know, it's yeah. not that kind of false love. It's a love that they're trying to build my, my soul up, trying to help me and strengthen me to be able to get to heaven. That's for God, you know? And when I look at people, I try to look at them the way that I felt like I was able to look at myself, like God does. Not as how I want to look at things, you know, as, as a flawed human being. I got to look at them and say, well, God loves this person. Why? Whatever I'm feeling that's not right is my problem. That's my my judgment. That's my whatever it is. But God loves that person, despite the ugliness that I see. You know, because I do have eyes and I do have a rational mind. It's hard for me to ignore the fact that this person seems to be so full of hate. You know, and yeah, it's hard to ignore those things. But I gotta look past and say, you know, there's probably some reason behind this. You know. Homeless people are, are often an easy, easy group to, to kind of pinpoint because they're outside of the norm. They're, they're choosing to, and sometimes they, they don't choose it, and they just are struggling and can't get back into the fold. But often it's their choices that keep them there because there's a lot of help that's out there. But until they're ready for it, they're not coming back to that help. And for whatever reason, I can make all kinds of judgments about it, but that doesn't do any good at that moment when I got to deal with that person. And yeah. how, do I, how do I share God's love with somebody who may feel like God couldn't possibly love them? Well, I felt like that before. I don't want them to feel that way. So that automatically starts to help me to get a little closer to how God loves. You know, I've committed some sins in my life. And why should God forgive me? I know how this person feels. I can start to have some empathy for them. But ultimately... If I, I take a look at that person, I say, you know, I can't try to convince them the same way that I was convinced. I got to sometimes just love the person. And it doesn't mean I excuse bad behavior because that's not love. That's, that's accommodation. And accommodation is actually encouraging sin. I'm not going to do that. But, you know, I, I, for instance, I saw a guy who was, was at mass and he was a homeless guy. I've seen him many times before comes in and he steals from the vote of candles. You know, he's actually stealing money from God. He's stealing yeah. money from the church. It's bad enough to steal money, but when you do it in that capacity, you're adding sin upon sin. Now, he may be ignorant, so there may be some, some things that he just doesn't understand that he's stealing from God that way. He might just be thinking, hey, I'm just stealing a few bucks, it's no big deal. You know, who knows what, God knows his heart and knows what level of sin this really is. I have to be careful of not putting too much of a judgment on because while I don't steal, and I certainly wouldn't steal from God, that could be my judgment of saying how bad that sin is for this particular guy. And that keeps me from, from wanting to interact. However, I've, I've realized that this particular guy, I've started to strike up a conversation with him. I probably shouldn't do it, you know, but I give him some money. It's not much, but I encourage him not to steal from God. And now I'm getting to share a little bit of why I think it's a big deal. But I don't, I don't pull any punches. I tell him, this is a horrible sin, what you're doing. This is terrible. Don't do this. And I give him a little bit of money. I, I figure, 
hey, he's the poor. I've got extra money. The money doesn't really belong to me. God gave it to me. And not only did he tell me to share his love, but he doesn't want me to be a miser and hold back on something. Now, does the guy do something wrong with it? I'm not going to get into that because that's on him. It's on me if I have that extra money in my pocket and I'm going to go out and waste it on a stupid Starbucks yeah. you know, instead of helping this guy out. But more so, I do it to be able to just help him carry this message to say, hey, what you're doing is wrong. I'm not going in there and just saying, oh, buddy, hey, I feel so bad for you. You're down and out, blah, blah, blah. He's used to milking people for that. That's, that's not how I'm going to do it. That's not truly loving this guy. Telling him what he's doing wrong is far better. And then I give him a little bit of money for having to endure me telling him about it. But I do it because I, I actually do care about this guy. I don't want him to go to, to hell. I don't want him to ignore the chance that, hey, I'm actually in a church and I could be doing saying a prayer. Maybe something better would happen for me. I want this to eventually happen. Well, the other day, he came in again during Mass. So I went over and I, I talked to him. I said, hey, you know, i got to finish Mass here. But if you stick around, and this was because the consecration was about to happen. So I was like, this is a perfect opportunity. I can't convince this guy. Jesus is about to, to convince him for me. So that's my intention, right? So I get him to sit in the back and just wait until Mass is over. And I, I said, I have something for you. He does. He waits the whole time. And... He was quiet, he was patient. You know, I don't know what was going on in his head, but that's not my job, that's God's job. God's gonna work on him. And he either is gonna accept God's call or he's not. But he was there in the presence of God while he was waiting for this minor bit of money. And guess what he didn't do? He didn't steal from the church. He didn't add additional sin. And for me to give, you know, I think I gave him five bucks. That's not, that's not really much of anything to be honest with you, and yet he was so grateful for it, and we had a great conversation, and he felt like, hey, somebody actually loves me, and he's connecting that to being at Mass. He's connecting that to being in the presence of, of Christ, and I only hope that he was able to see the true intention I had, which was to share the love of Christ with him, even though I was so removed from it because I really wanted Christ himself to share that love. But I'll tell you what, I felt it. The whole time I was going up up to receive, I felt this love burning in my heart for, for the Lord and for the Lord to give back to this guy. It was as if that straw was happening again, you know, not to the same magnitude as when I was in his presence. Although it's because I have my human surroundings, you know, all the the different things, my thoughts even about going back and talking to this guy and what will I say and I'm trying to put all that stuff away but I'm human, it still comes in. But I'm able to feel that love of Christ when I'm receiving and then to be able to go back and be with that guy and share share that love with him. What a wonderful experience. And that's what it, he's asking us to do is to, to just live our life to whatever opportunity he puts in place that we get to, to share the love of Christ with another person. Okay, so you get these three lessons, which are unbelievable. I mean, you could write a book on any one of them. What happens next? So now he tells me I've got to go back. And it was it still seems fairly abrupt. But I had already made my decision, and he honored my decision, and that was it. Now I had to actually go back. And this is the only time I say I felt pain. I didn't, I didn't feel so much pain as... Like, like a physical pain. I didn't feel physical pain to this, but I felt like my spirit was was almost revolting against my will. I felt like my my legs must have been soaked in concrete and I'm walking through quicksand. And it was the hardest effort to move, but I had to go back the exact same way that I had come in. And every step away from Jesus got harder and harder. So... That was the only time I ever felt anything that felt remotely physical. And and yet, you know, I, I know I could see behind me as I was going, but my focus now was not on Jesus. It was going back. And I could see where that dark void was, was now my hospital room. So it was no longer that dark void. And remember how I had said, you know, I didn't bring anything with me. That's why I really feel that connection is that that dark void, had I stayed there, I would have been choosing my own emptiness over Christ. You know, I would have missed that whole experience with him 
just for me to stay there and feel his love, but not even contemplate where it was coming from. That's how I lived my life. I lived my life with all kinds of blessings, never giving credit to God. Or even when I did give credit, it was, you know, hey, thanks for that, God. You know, and then I'm so wonderful. God loves me so much. Look what he did for me. What a, what a joke I was, right? I wasn't really grateful. I was, I was happy I got something. And, and now I'm seeing this hospital room and I'm realizing that's where I'm going back to. And I could see I did not look good. They had this, this big green machine on me. And I later found out that it's called a Lucas machine. What it does is um, automated CPR. So it's, you know, it's doing compression, chest compressions. Of course, they got you hooked up to tubes and all kinds of other things. So they're taking care of you that way. But I was dead for over 10 minutes. I, at this point, as I'm getting closer and closer to my, my hospital room, they take the, the machine off. You know, I don't know that they were going to call it at the time or, or what. I, I don't have that kind of a memory of that experience to say, yeah, they were definitely calling it. But that's what it looked like to me. That's the impression I had as I was coming back. Like, I'm dead. They're not going to bring me back. They're giving up. It's over. However long. And I didn't know how long I was gone for. I thought I was gone for years. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't tell you how long I was gone for. But... I get, I get closer and closer, and I'm, I'm realizing I'm going back in my body. And so you're seeing this whole scene come closer and closer as you're going back towards it? Yeah, and, and again, this is where the time thing, you know, I remember every step I took, but it, it seemed quick, you know, much quicker than it did, but it wasn't as fast as that instant of being with the light, but it wasn't anywhere near the length of time that it should have took, so the time frame was just all topsy-turvy to me. But... As soon as I got back to my body, I just snapped right back into my body. There was no instruction manual. I didn't need anything. I just, for, I didn't even feel like I had to even make a decision. It just happened. I just kind of went back into my body. The doctors put down that I spontaneously revived. So that's what they, they wrote to their notes about this. And by the look of the doctor's face, this, this is one of the favorite memories I do have. Because like I said, when I, when I came back to here in life, I, I have gaps in my memory just like anybody else does. But this part I remember very distinctly is that, you know, they got you strapped down, they got this stuff in your face, and they got, you know, who knows who doing what to you. You know, I, I don't remember what state of undress I was in, but I, I know I was helpless and at their mercy. But I tried to sit up as much as I could because there's a doctor sitting right there by my face. And I said, did I just die? And, you know, he could barely hear me because I had tubes in my mouth. I had all this stuff going on. But so it comes out all gargled. And he gets down a little bit closer. And he has this look like, you know, I, I don't even know if I can do it well enough. But it was as if he's looking at a dead body talking to him. He, I know he thought I was dead. And I said it again. And he said, yeah, you just died. And then he tries to convince me to lay back down and relax, which was easy. I was like, yeah, all right. You know, this is, I had the greatest experience. I couldn't tell him yet because, you know, I had all this stuff in my mouth. But he's now he's trying to calm me down. I'm just like, this is great, you know. I can't believe that I was able to just go to heaven and I got to come back. I'm like, this is so wonderful. All the pain I had, I could feel it. I mean, it instantly, it was like a ton of bricks just hitting you. Boom, all this pain. Except that euphoria of the love of Christ, that closeness with him, wasn't gone. So when I stepped back into my body, it felt like that portal or that tunnel closed up. So physically, you know, for, for a human being, it felt like it closed up. But I know it was wide open because it was open when I died. And when I, when I came back, it only felt like it closed up because I could feel all the cares of the world come back in. Am I going to die from another heart attack here? Is, is my heart going to stop? Because that's they're, they're talking. I can hear what they're saying. They're like, well, we've got to make sure he's heart stable. How is it looking? You know, they're doing all these things. So all that chaos is back, you know. And that chaos interrupts that, that free flow of God's love from that connection to him. And it's only by how much we let it happen. When he, I could still feel his love. All that pain that I felt, I could feel it, but I was able to separate it from his love. And I think that's got to be what the saints do, is yeah. that it's there, it's present, but when you accept it, like, I knew I was going to suffer. I knew it was going to hurt worse when I got back. 
I mean, how could it how could it be better? You just yeah. died, you know. And so it it doesn't. It's not like when you're dead, your body somehow regenerates and becomes healthier. Yeah, they've been working on you frantically for ten minutes straight. They got this Lucas machine doing compressions on you. They're they're shocking you. They're sticking you with God knows what. Your body is taking a beating while they're trying to bring you back. Right. And that, that machine broke a bunch of my ribs, too. So I had that additional pain. It was hard to breathe. You know, it was, it was, it was kind of a, a pain in the neck. You know, and, I mean, I remember I had to be on oxygen for quite a while because my heart wasn't strong anyway. So my heart now probably was weaker, but also had these broken ribs. So every time I would try to breathe, it was just excruciating pain. You know, so... And yet, at the same time, I couldn't shake the smile off my face because I just was with Jesus. I couldn't have cared less about the pain. And then, then they tell me, you know, the doctor says, we got to put in this pacemaker slash defibrillator, one that does both because it's, it's a different type of device. They wanted to be able to stimulate my heart to bring it down as opposed to just shocking it down. So they said, we want to do this and we got to do it right away because we, we don't know that you're going to be stable and how long it's going to be for because you're still having crazy amount of arrhythmias and they said the only problem is we can't give you any anesthesia so we're not going to put you out they gave me a little local but you know well, local that doesn't really do much especially when they start to go deep and with this particular machine they had to put wires into my heart because that's how it stimulates the heart so i'm feeling this but wow. let me tell you it was the easiest surgery i've ever gone through that's i've had yeah, I've had other surgeries where they put you out, and prior to that, it's far worse, you know? I was more humiliated when, when they would have to go in and, and do the angiograms or things like that, and they go through your thigh, through your, your artery, and they go in there and, you know, they got to shave you. That's far more humiliating than, than what I, the pain that, I mean, that, that was painful to me, to sit there and, you know, be all exposed with 50 people staring at you. And to me, the surgery was almost as joyful as being in heaven because that love, I couldn't be separated from it. And wow. the doctor, he felt, he was such a nice doctor. He was trying to talk to me and tell me jokes, talk about sports, and I couldn't have cared less about any of that stuff. I was like, you know, doc, I, I didn't say it to him because I didn't want to be impolite. And, you know, I really didn't know how to explain what I had just experienced. Wow. Wow. And he wasn't asking those types of questions either. But, but I was just like, I wanted him to be quiet so that I could just think about what I had just experienced. I just, I was so joyful. So my mind was split. I was entertaining him and helping him because I wanted to be kind to him. But honestly, I was just in love with this experience and how much the residual love was helping me to get through it to where I could feel the pulls and the tugs and all that on my body. But I didn't, as much as the pain was there, it was nothing. You know, I, I really, it was the easiest time I spent in the hospital. I was only in for a week, too. Imagine that. I was That's only in for the week after I had died. They, they thought I was going to be in the ICU yet again for who knows how long, maybe indefinitely. I want to touch on something you brought up in your book. You brought up that green machine, the Lucas machine. The reason I'm bringing that up is because so many people, you know, they question if you were actually dead. But that was something that was significant to you because they removed that machine just as you were coming back into your body. Once they recognized you were alive, they removed that machine from you. And you asked the nurse specifically about the machine, and she was, she was surprised, right? She's like, how did you know that? Yeah, and, and not only did, did that surprise her, but I was telling her after, after I realized that she was surprised by that, so I, I'm like, okay, I still wasn't in my body because I... I it, it was. It happened so quickly, and yet it, it happened over a period of time. So it was hard to really understand my time frame. But I told her, you were over here and you were over there. I could describe everything as I was coming back. I described where she was at. I had full memory of everything that was happening. Now, I couldn't remember after I got out of there what she was doing. I had no clue where, where she went or what she was doing. But I did, when I recognized her coming back in after the surgery and you know she was giving me a the the prep of what what I had just experienced and I was I was like oh yeah you were the one who was doing this and this and this I didn't know she was the charge nurse I kind of figured she was important because she was doing you know giving orders and doing most of the the stuff but it blew her away 
It completely blew her mind. But not only did I know what she was doing, I knew what everybody else was doing. Wow. And, I mean, there was information I just couldn't have possibly have had, you know, yeah. especially because when you're down there, you know, like I said before I died, I could only see at my feet. So I could still only see that, that crucifix and then heads above me. It wasn't like I could see the people behind who were working certain machines and people yeah. who were taking things in and out and what they were doing down the hall, you know. But when I was coming back, I could see everything. There was so many things. So that whole time, that whole week that I was in the hospital, this word got out. Every nurse seemed to care because there's plenty of people who are like, yeah, who cares about that kind of stuff? They just couldn't care less, you know. Yeah. But there were nurses coming from different floors who clearly were interested in, you know, what did this guy see? Because... They, they couldn't believe that I would have that kind of a memory. And then they were shocked by how I looked. They said, you look like you're glowing. I ended up taking a picture of it. It doesn't, to me, the picture doesn't look like I'm glowing. It, it looks like I'm happy. Literally, I had the nurse do it, like, right afterwards, you know. I was like, hey, everybody's taking pictures for, for all these reasons. I want a picture of what I look like right after I died. I just want to see what it looks like. It didn't look like it was glowing, but it looked like I was so peaceful. And... And to me, that's what I felt like. Like, I was just full of peace. Yet, all these nurses for the whole week kept saying, oh, you're glowing. You're glowing. And I don't know if they meant, like, glowing, you know, I assume they probably meant, like, a, you know, how a pregnant woman can sometimes look like she's glowing. Like, she's just so content and so happy. Yeah. So I think, that's, I think they were seeing the, the love of Christ in me that we, we can tell when somebody has that experience and somebody is is walking with christ we can feel it when somebody's walking with the other stuff we can feel that too you know yeah. I mean? you don't have to you don't have to know somebody's in a crabby mood when you walk in a room sometimes you just feel the tension i think we we, we can be more intuitive to to the good too it's just often maybe we're so connected to our own bad you know that we we miss it it was unmistakable these nurses said that it was unmistakable that they could tell I had seen something, and that's how they encouraged me to tell them what I saw. Um, so and, you, you story right away. Yeah, to, to them, I was just telling them, yeah, I died, I went to heaven, I saw Jesus. I didn't go into all the details because, you know, they're also on their breaks or whatever yeah. they were on. But when I would tell it, one of the interesting things was my heart rate would shoot right up. You know, because they had me hooked up to monitors, so. Yeah. But it wasn't painful. When I would tell it was, but it was definitely taxing my heart. It was as if I was so excited about because it it was like a rush of that that love just would come back over me, and so even when I was I was thinking I don't I don't recall sleeping the whole week I was there. I mean it was a ton of prayer, and you know I I read I didn't watch any TV I couldn't have cared less about my phone, um, but. It was just total, totally being content just sitting there with, with God. I really just enjoyed being with God that whole week. Every time somebody came in, I just wanted to share his love. I, I distinctly remember the reason I wanted to was for with the lesson I was told. This is, do this. I'm doing the prayers. I'm doing the suffering. So every opportunity I got to share his love, I was, I was like, yeah, I'm doing all three. I was so excited. In, in your book... In a lot of the videos I've seen, they cover your NDE and up until the point you go back into your body. But, you know, there's a lot that's happened since. How are you doing with your health right now? What's going on there? Well, my, my health now, it, it's, it's been a lot different than for the first few years afterwards. I still have autoimmune disease. Now they're, they're in remission now, which is incredible. I'll share a little bit more about that. Nobody has ever wanted to hear about that and when it starts to come out. Um, you know, I don't have any proof of, of this, but I certainly feel very strongly of, of part of the reason why I'm in remission now. But I was on the liver transplant and the kidney transplant list. Of course, I wouldn't take another government vaccine, so that eliminated me being on the list. So they took me off those lists because I wouldn't take the vaccine. But that's a, another story. But my health was not good. I had a lot of stuff. It, up until I got the transplant, I was fighting it. I thought, okay, God's going to heal me. He, you know, he's going to give me a new heart. I, I thought he was going to replace my stony heart and, you know, give me, give me this heart of flesh, but, which he did. But it's much deeper than that because he did intend for me to have this transplant. Um, and it's amazing because 
that took a lot of trust. I did not want to let the doctors do that. I did not want to go through that surgery. But I had this wonderful doctor who was treating me for my autoimmune disease, and she was a heart specialist as well. So she, unfortunately, she doesn't work at, at the clinic anymore, but she was the best doctor, hands down. I, I just, I really had a love for her. She's the only one who ever asked me about what happened when I died. And she wasn't, I don't think she was expecting, and maybe she was, she's very intuitive, she's a smart woman, but she, uh, I think she was just asking me, like, because she wanted to know how I'm dealing with the fact that I died. No other doctors cared. They didn't ever once ask me about that. You know, they'd have you go to, to a psychologist and make sure that you're, you know, not depressed, not anxious, because they don't want that, that affects your heart and your ability to recover. But it was never, I mean, being a psychotherapist, I know the only concern they had was to make sure that I wasn't going to exasperate my condition. Yeah. None of them, none of them ever asked about how are you after dying. I think that's a real flaw in the medical system. I think that they're really missing some, probably because there, I, I did not realize this, but there are so many people who have near-death experiences. And yeah. I don't think that science is prepared or willing to investigate that because they're so used to only investigating things that they have instruments and tools to measure and they can't measure God. They don't have a tool that can investigate him. So they're at a loss. And, you know, quite honestly, a lot of the things they do, they make up anyway. So it's, you know, they try to fit it together and make the best sense of it, but it's, it's still picking straws, you know, they just really can't come up with anything that's solid and it changes over time where God doesn't change. But she did, she asked me these things and she finally, she tr I trusted her and I told her, I said, look, don't lie to me, you know, don't sugarcoat it. That's how I really worded it. So I said, just don't sugarcoat it. I don't wanna, I don't want you to give me the positive spin just so that I don't, because I'm, I'm tough enough to handle this. I just wanna know, am I gonna die again? Is, is this something I'm gonna live through? She, goes, she told me that, that she uh, was gonna be with me no matter what through this fight, she goes, but I think you should get a transplant. I don't think you're gonna last much longer. And she knew I didn't want to do this. She yeah. was very patient with me and kept providing information on it, but she respected the fact that I didn't want to go the transplant route. Um, but when we asked that, we had that very candid conversation. She, I trusted her and I said, okay, let's, let's do it then. Let me set up the point and I'll go meet with the team. And it was like a day or two, I was meeting with the team and I, I thought, you know, this makes sense. They've got, they've got good studies to show that this can be effective. Um, people are living, so I mean, clearly it works. So I, I went ahead and got myself on the list and I think it was total of six months after I got put on the list that I got my heart transplant. I had to leave Minnesota to do it because Minnesota, they go by a four hour window. So you have to be, the heart has to come from place within four hours to get from that person into you. So it's a very small window. And when you live in Minnesota, yeah, we I think Chicago was, was one of the cities that I, I could have gotten a pool from, which is, you know, when you're looking for a heart transplant, maybe they're they're not gonna have the best hearts because maybe some of the ways they die isn't isn't really helpful for a heart transplant. Yeah. But there are a lot of deaths, so that there's a possibility. But they said you'll never get a heart transplant here in Minnesota. And I was really, really high on the list. So, I mean, I mean, or low, however you want to look at it. I was very close to getting, you know, there were very few people ahead of me on the list. But with my blood type and the size of my body, they go by a lot of different factors to be able to see what kind of heart will be a good match for you. They said, you're just not going to have a chance here. But we have a clinic, and this is Mayo Clinic, they have said, we have one down in Phoenix. So, down there, it's far more densely populated cities that are within the same, that four, four hour window. So you'll get a heart much quicker. And like I said, I was, I was on the, the, the second tier, but at the top of the second tier. So once they got into me and they found the heart, which was two months after I got down to Phoenix, I got the heart. I do want to say this though, cause this is the part that I really enjoy. So I'm going into the, you know, I have to go into the doctor virtually every day when I'm there, I'm on hospice care and you know, I'm, I'm really close to death. They kept telling me, oh, we had a heart come in, but we had to re reject it because it wasn't good enough, you know? And finally, as we're getting closer to when I actually did get my heart, which was on Ash Wednesday, I got my heart. So amazing. yeah, it was totally amazing. 
But I, I had an appointment the day before, and I said, you know, because they told me again, hey, we had one, we just had to reject it. And I'm like, well, don't reject the next one, because I'm not going to make it to the end of the week. I mean, I knew it. It was the same feeling as I had before. I was going to die. And so I said, just don't reject it, because... I figured God's going to get me out of this somehow, and he's going to give me a heart. Just don't, don't let the human beings mess it up, right? <laughs> and so I, I get back to the hospice place where we were staying. And I had to have my mom take care of me because my wife had to stay with the kids. You know, We didn't want to uproot the whole family. and You could only have one caregiver in, in there, and you couldn't have kids. So I had to have my, my mom come. And I told my mom, you know, I'm going to take a nap. I'm really tired. But uh, if I don't wake up from this nap, I love you, but tell my family, you know, this and this for each. I gave each one of the kids something and told her to tell them that. And so uh, I went to sleep and I woke up to the phone call. And my nurse, my transplant nurse was like, Brian, we got a heart. It's a good one. You got to get in here right now. You have to come in right now. And luckily the, the hospice care was right on the hospital ground. So it took us, you know, a minute to get there. Yeah. Yeah. So it was wonderful. We got in there, got the, got the transplant. What was really cool is when I got out of the hospital a week later again, so keep that in mind, they cut my chest open and, you know, do all this stuff, and I'm, I'm out in a week. And so, yeah, it really is. I, I, I could sleep laying flat, though, because, you know, just, there's still blood pooling around. Or it's just really uncomfortable, to be honest with you. It, it, so having a wedge pillow was recommended, so they... But I didn't like the wedge pillow underneath of me. I wanted it underneath the mattress so that it was just a little bit more comfortable. So they brought in the, the maintenance staff to lift up my mattress. And you know what they found underneath of it? A green scapular. No way. Yep. And it had been blessed and specifically for whoever would be the next patient in, in there. And it was right under where I had been sleeping this whole time. <laughs> no way. That's a blessed mother taking care of you still. Always, always. And you know, I forgot to say this. This is the other part. Before I went to sleep, I had picked up the St. Jude prayer at the, at the I, I, I think it was, I don't think it was at the hospital. I think it was at the hospice care. It was sitting in one of the, the prayer rooms. And uh, just the prayer for, for impossible causes, you know, despaired of causes. And I had prayed that and I had promised, you know, if, if you help me out with this, you know, get my prayer through. Let's, let's get this ball rolling. You know, I'll, I'll make sure I, I talk about your prayer. So I have to put that plug out there because I'll tell you what, St. Jude, he works with the Blessed Mother. They they work, they work do some good work for us. Um, but yeah, it's all these things kept connecting. And I just looking back on it, I can see how God's hand was there. I felt his hand with me the whole time. It didn't surprise me that these things popped up because I could feel his love. I didn't freak out. I did tell them, hey, look, don't reject the next one because human beings, we're unpredictable. We do all kinds of dumb things, you know. Yeah. And, but but honestly, I, I knew that God was going to get me that heart. I just, you know, and I don't know that he's going to let me, however long he's going to let me live with this heart. There was no guarantee how long of an extra life he was going to give me. But like I said before, I, I really don't know what it's going to take to kill me because I mean, we went through COVID, which was supposed to kill, you know, 90% yeah. of the population. I was around tons of people all the time at the hospital. I never got COVID. So I have wow. no immune system. You, you tell me how a guy with no immune system doesn't catch this highly yeah. communicable disease, right? <laughs> so I, I just, I'm baffled by the things that God has been able to do. It, it's beyond explanation. And that's what I think trusting in God is because... If I sat there worrying about all the stress, all the suffering, all the things, there's no way I would have been able to make it through it because I wouldn't be trusting in him to do yeah. this. I would have been trying to hyper-focus on what I could control. I have one more question for you. You've been so gracious with your time, and I really appreciate it. This story is unbelievable. But one of the things that really impacted me in your book was, as we mentioned earlier, seeing the look on your kids' faces as you're going out the door in the ambulance. How has all this impacted your kids? How are they doing now? Have they gotten through it okay? How's all that going? My daughter is my oldest. She has a lot of anxiety. Her mom has a lot of anxiety. My wife took it really hard because she constantly was in her head thinking about how am I going to tell my kids that their dad's dead. She thought I was going to be dead no matter what. She did not think that 
that this was going to work out. When you looked at, when you looked at me, you thought I was going to die. I mean, that is just impossible. I would walk through the hospital and people were like looking at dead man walking. I mean, the looks that people would give because it was shocking. To put it to put it in a more illustrative fashion, I'm covered with tattoos. People, the the nursing staff, the doctors at the when I was getting the transplant in Phoenix, once they put that new heart in, they said, "Whoa, you got a lot of tattoos. We didn't know you had tattoos. My skin was such an ashen gray. I did not look like the same person." Wow. Yeah, it was crazy. It, I mean, this was unbelievable. I literally was a dead person. Now, I'll, I'll send you my pictures of my heart, so that way you, I don't know how you can post it on here. You'll have to figure that out. But it, my heart, when you look at it, and when people watch this video and they see what my heart looked like, it should not have been functioning. That's what the doctors told me. They said, your heart, this is a medical miracle that you were living because your heart is with this spot and this spot and this spot. They listed out four or five different spots. They said, there's so much damage, so much has happened in this little area that your heart could not possibly have functioned, just in this one spot. And then they gave me four or five different ones that were all the same, the same story. So this heart should not have been functioning, and it really looks like a, a piece of beef jerky that a pit bull got a hold of. I mean, that's how bad my heart looked. But the Lord carried you through... For two years. For two years after I died... To, and, and who knows how long before that that I had, you know, because this wasn't an overnight thing. This was something that had built up for many years. But for two years after I died, before I got my heart transplant, is uh, two years and two months, really. So that's how long I had to live with this heart. And that whole while, I know it was sitting right in God's hand. He was the reason that my heart was still functioning up until I got that transplant. And And it's a beautiful thing to think about that, all I had to do was get out of the way, lay back and trust him, not worry about how it's going to turn out. If, if it would have been his decision that I didn't get that heart and I would have, so be it. I had two extra years to be able to, they weren't great two years, I'm not going to lie about that. I did get to see my kids a lot, so that was wonderful, you know, but they weren't pleasant. And even the years after that, for a long time, weren't so pleasant. I did have an opportunity to carry the relics of St. Therese of Lisieux. Wow. And this was incredible because her parents' relics were right there too. So you're around three saints. I wasn't planning on being able to carry it. I look a lot stronger and healthier than I was, particularly at that time. But, you know, I, I try not to look like I'm in bad shape. I don't want people to feel bad for me. I don't, I don't like to do that. But the priest says, hey, you know, Grab a hold of that 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 side because it had handles on the rug. It's a huge it's a huge thing. I mean, it's got her whole remains in there. Wow! And so I got to carry it. And you know what the craziest thing was? About two months after that, I had to go back for labs and a big workup at the doctor, and all my labs had reversed. So while I wasn't on the list anymore for my liver or for the kidney transplant because I refused the vaccine, I no longer qualified for a liver transplant or a kidney transplant. Wow. Yeah, and then it got even better because about three months after that, I had my annual checkup, which is a very extensive checkup where they do all these tests, you know, my whole body, particularly considering that I have all these autoimmune diseases. They go back through, now my kidneys are actually healthier than the average, average human being's kidneys are. And it's the kidneys, they don't have the same regenerative abilities as like the liver does so the liver you know it's possible that it could have regenerated itself and and healed you know probably not in that short span of time it's not very realistic there's no no research or literature that has ever demonstrated such a, a drastic change but it's possible because it's the liver kidneys aren't the same so i went from needing a kidney transplant to now my kidneys are healthier than everybody else's it, it's unbelievable. And I can only say the only difference is that I was able to carry those relics. I, I didn't have like this profound shock come over me, you know, when I, when I did that. I just didn't. But I, I can't get my mind to not go back to that because one of the greatest things of this experience is reading, reading her book when I was sick and just seeing how what she had said lined up with what Jesus told me. It was about living your life as a prayer. 
doing those little things every chance they they come up you know and enduring i mean i remember reading that she the the person the the other nun that people thought was her best friend was the one who annoyed her the most <laughs> and i think you know she was so much in love with god that she was like i'm going to endure this and I'm going to make sure that I'm, I'm not rejecting this person because of my own personal annoyance. And everybody thought she loved her the most. And yet it was the one who, who kind of rubbed her the wrong way the most. What a beautiful way to live God's love. And so I had this strong, strong attraction to, to trying to, to emulate the way that she lived. She loved the Blessed Virgin. She loved Jesus with all of her heart. And... You can't go wrong with models like that to live after. And, you know, yeah, I love Samson. I love David. But they were very flawed in, in the way that they, they lived their life. Granted, they also were very wonderful, too, because they allowed God to work through them. But I want to I get closer and closer. I want to keep learning about these beautiful people. And so having that experience of reading, reading that and then being able to see her relics, I was so touched. When the priest asked me to, I, I was actually kind of scared because it's like, Am I strong enough? Those things look heavy. And you've got to have like six guys carry it. So, I mean, it's not like I was all by myself. But yeah. but I was nervous because who wants to be the guy to drop the relics of St. Therese, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that would have been horrible. But I didn't. It, it wasn't hard at all for me. And I just, I keep thinking about how this drastic change happened. And this was just, you know, this past year. So, I mean... I'm not even to a year at this point of having this miraculous change in my health. So last, last year at this time, I was in bad shape. And now, I'm not. And it's such night and day difference that I'm able to, to work out now. I, I actually like working out. I mean, it's always been something that I've been a, uh, enjoy doing. And I couldn't do it for so many years. And, you know, all these medications they put you on, it makes your body weaker. and And yet... All of a sudden, I'm taking such low doses of these medications, and it's only the medications that they put me on that make me feel bad anymore. So I'm just trying to taper off of those as much as I can because God has obviously done something, again, miraculous in me. And this I can only attest that it's because I have gotten completely out of the way and released all my attachments to whether or not I'm going to suffer. In fact, like I said before... I kind of feel like, wow, if I'm not suffering, am I doing things the right way? Am I making it easier on myself? And I question whether or not I'm actually doing good because he does chastise the one he loves, you know, and he, he gives you a little bit of, of, of chance to prove yourself. And I don't think it's to prove ourselves to him. It's to prove that we actually do love him. How can I know that I'm willing to let God work through me if I don't have any adversity? If I only have ease, ease and comfort in my life, do I really love God? I'll be, I'll be getting filleted alive, saying, "Oh, let me, this is too much. Let me go back." You know. That's incredible that you say that, Brian. My wife and I just had a conversation about that very thing the other day. She's been reading the story of a soul by Saint Teresa of Sioux and about the life of Saint Teresa of Avila, and she actually said that to me just the other day. I'm worried that we might not be doing this right, that things are going so well for us. Things are going so well for our kids. You know what's really interesting is that we, we often will pray for things and then we don't get it. And we, we can feel disappointment. I remember often, particularly before this experience, but often as a Protestant, I always expected that you, you pray for it, God's going to give it to you, you know? He's not a magic genie. He doesn't just do things on our command. And often I look back and I say, well, the things that I was praying for were not for me. But so when you, when you ask for things and you're denied it, it's not a denial because he doesn't love you. It's often a denial, at least in my life, what I found was a denial of something that would not have been for my good. It wouldn't yeah. have led me to become closer to him. And, and even if it would have, it wouldn't have led me to the where I'm at now had I not had the suffering that I've gone through. There is no way I would be in the same position that I'm in now. It's just, we can all agree to that, that yeah. this had a profound change in my life. And so that difference in my, my experience of praying for things 
earlier in my life and now I just I don't expect things and and yet when I do get good things I don't reject those either I don't say well just give me the suffering because who who really likes suffering now I am joyful when I suffer and I find that the times of my suffering are far more enjoyable because I do feel closer to God because I have to hold on to him all tighter it's as if there's this special connection to God when I'm suffering. And when he took that, the, the concerns away for, for all those other illnesses that I had, you know, there was a sense of loss because I thought, well, how am I gonna, how am I gonna keep close to God? And yet now I just, I make a, an extra effort to be grateful for, for what I do have. I, I always have, since the time of my death, until now, I thank him every single day when I wake up. <clears throat> Never fails. I just am so grateful that another day my eyes opened up. And and that's a beautiful thing. But the way that I thank him for things now, I, I'll see I'll see my granddaughter and I thank him. Every time I see her, she smiles at me. Every time I walk in the room, it's unbelievable. It's almost as if he's allowing me to have this experience over and over again. Because seeing your grandchild smile at you is even better than your kids smiling at you in a way, <laughs> you know, because I'm at a different place in my life. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. It's just, it's every moment that I see something good, I think, wow, you planned that for me, God. And, and it prepares me for the next time something bad does come, which they do. I mean, I still get things that challenge me all the time. It's just, they don't have the same effect because I know it's just like the sun and the rain. You got to have them both in order to have a balance in life. You know, the grass doesn't grow and the flowers don't grow without a bit of rain. They also need the sun too. So if we get particular to only wanting one, well, we're not gonna have the flowers either. And, you know, having that mixture of both in the right order is what makes life super enjoyable. And yeah. if you didn't have any suffering in your life and you only had joy, you would probably be the most miserable self-indulgent narcissist living in Hollywood and you know running the country because you're a politician you know that's that's the kind of people that that don't have trials because they're rejecting everything good and when you yeah. when you don't reject good yeah you're gonna have to stand up for some things that are gonna be a little hard to do you're gonna have to to reject some things that are make gonna make your life easier because you're going to have more comfort. But who wants comfort? I want comfort in eternity. I don't want comfort here because it's never really that comfortable. Exactly, Brian. I could talk to you all day long. I mean, you're such a joyful person. You love the faith, and I love talking about the faith. I mean, I could just go on and on talking with you, but we've already gone almost two and a half hours here. I really appreciate the time. What an amazing experience. I'm glad to see that you you're you know you're becoming healthier. I mean, it's a great thing. Your story is remarkable. It's like it really is a modern day biblical story. I really appreciate you taking the time to share with me. I hope we can stay in touch. It was my pleasure being here. I, I really enjoyed talking with you, and I love your questions. I really enjoy when people ask me questions, sincere questions of you know, things that we're curious of, because it makes me reflect on my story in a way that maybe I hadn't thought of and helps me to understand my story in a better way because there's no way I'm the end all be all. I, I am, you know, not not a complete moron, but I'm not, you know, Albert Einstein level of intelligence either. You know, and getting somebody else's perspective really helps to pull out the fullness of this story and I just I'm so grateful for it. Every time I meet somebody like you who has that just inquisitive and courageous spirit to ask those questions and really has the desire to to learn more about you know what god has in store for us this has been a tremendous grace i'm telling you this has been a true pleasure for me like i said i really enjoyed talking with you and i hope that your story will touch people like it's touched me i've already written notes from just the other videos that you put together so i can try and put this advice and this experience together in my own life and hopefully integrate some of these lessons that you learned into my life to help me with my walk. And I'm grateful for that. Well, thank you. That concludes my interview with Brian Hoyland. I'm so grateful to Brian 
for agreeing to speak with me about his amazing life, death, and return to life. From the first time I saw Brian interviewed, I knew I wanted to speak to him about it if I could arrange it, and I'm so glad I did. Unlike a lot of NDE accounts, Brian's is that of a practicing Catholic who had an experience that was very consistent with the long-standing teachings of the Catholic Church. He experienced the Blessed Mother's love and protection, the intercession of the saints, particularly St. Teresa of Lisieux and St. Jude, leading up to, during, and after his NDE. He was instructed by Jesus himself about the value and purpose of redemptive suffering and how to love God and neighbor as Jesus commanded, both long-standing and fundamental teachings of the Catholic Church. Further, he is more committed to his faith following his trials than he was before, and it was a pleasure to talk to him about it. You can learn more about Brian's story by reading his book, From Sudden Death to Paradise, The Story of a Near-Death Experience. It's available on Amazon.com in print and digital format, and I will leave a link to it in the description below. Thanks very much for watching, and as always, see Emperor Adelante.